You all may be seated. God's given us a, a wonderful opportunity to lift our concerns to Him, and that's what we're going to do when we go to Him in prayer now. He also gives us a chance to sort of relieve ourselves of the burden that sin puts on our shoulders. And uh, we'll be doing that as well as we prepare to hear God's Word. Are, are there any needs or concerns? We've got a whole bunch in the bullet of the insert. Any needs or concerns? Yeah. Amen. That's wonderful. Yeah, let's, let's hear uh, seven years. Okay, let's give a little round of applause for that. That is outstanding news. Praise, praise God. Anything, anything else that we need to, re we need to remember? Yes, Diana. Uh, the Williams family on death of father We want to remember the, the Williams family on the passing of her father-in-law. Yes. How is, how is Bob's brother? Isn't, we've been praying for him, weren't we? Oh, my brother-in-law. Yeah, your brother-in-law. Um, yeah, no, he's, he's got hospice coming. Okay, okay. So we want to keep lifting them up in our prayers. Okay. Any, anything else we want to remember? Okay. You say that one more time. Mommy's in the hospital. Oh, your mom's in the hospital. Oh, my goodness. Yes, absolutely. We'll, we'll lift her up in our prayers. Thank you so much for sharing that. Really appreciate it. I think it's also appropriate for us to, to remember uh, a lot of folks in, in our world that's sick, but uh, I think it's still appropriate for us to, to lift Senator McCain up in our prayers. Uh, that would certainly uh, surprise the... the brain cancer diagnosis, so uh, he's one of our leaders. I think we, uh, we need to remember him in our prayers as well. Then, then as God's people, let's go to God in prayer. And I'll confess a little bit as a preparation to hear God's word. Uh, Y'all have the opportunity to lift these concerns up to God, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's go before God now in prayer. Lord God, before we say anything else, we've got to give you a thank you for the wonderful, beautiful day you've given us. Uh, it, it makes you feel good to be alive. Uh, with the sun shining, we had some rain, so things are kind of crisp and clean. It's, uh, thank you. We appreciate it. We also appreciate you bringing us together. It's a little warm in here, uh, but that's okay. There's also warmth here from your Holy Spirit, that spirit that brings us all together as one people, and we are truly grateful for that. Now, before we, uh, we hear your word read and, and proclaimed, there's something that we need to confess. You see, often we're not as, well, we're not as generous as we could be. You know, instead of giving out, we kind of pull back. Instead of sharing with others, we hold things for ourselves. Uh, we, we fail to be the people you've called us to be. Our generosity seems measured by an eyedropper. And for that, we're, we're sorry. And we, we confess that to you and ask for your forgiveness. In fact, we ask for your help so that we might be more giving, that we're, our goodness might be shown, shown by what we share with others. Lord God, help us to do that in the name of Jesus Christ. And now in the privacy of our hearts, we're going to lift up to you the concerns that we heard shared. We're going to lift up to you those needs that are in the insert. And we're going to lay before you those things that weigh heavy on our heart. Lord God, hear us as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing us and thank you for loving us. But right now, we thank you for answering us. We believe that you've forgiven our sins because we've confessed them in the name of Christ. And we believe that you will respond to our needs because we've also lifted those concerns in his name. And it's in the name of the one who taught us to pray, praying. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you all come on out front to collect our offering?
Katie, would you come over here for just a minute? I'm going to tell you something. You did, you did remarkably well. You were way better than that disc. <laughs> you know, that disc was just getting in the way. I wanted to hear you sing. Now, now Katie of uh, Freeland, right? Yes. What, what grade are you in? I'm in third grade. Fourth. Fourth. You're going into fourth? Mm -hmm. Well, she's, she's used to saying third. You know, but you're going into fourth grade and you can sing like that. That means you are about what, like 27? No, I'm nine years old. Nine years old. What poise? Whoa. Yeah, poise and talent and all kinds of things. Katie, you know, I'm telling you, uh, I really feel blessed that you sang for us today and I really appreciate it. So let's, let's give her a round of applause again. So thank you so much. And you can go with you, sit with your, your folks if you will. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you again for giving us a chance to be together. Bless this offering. Help those who lead our congregation put, to put it to good use. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Now y'all can sit, y'all who haven't already. Now, when I was a kid, and, and, and Katie, are those your brothers there too? Okay, your, your brothers there. I, I want to ask you if uh, this is the way you look at things. Hi. Hi. Uh, if this is the way you look at things. Uh, for you, what is summer? Tell me when summer starts and when summer ends. When, when does summer start and when does summer end? Okay, well, I'll tell you. Yeah, that was... <laughs> I don't think you want to applaud that. Uh, but when, when I was a kid, uh, we didn't use... Talk about summer beginning and ending. We didn't use any kind of scientific measurement. I mean, we didn't talk about the summer solstice, you know, the, the longest day of the year. We didn't talk about that as the beginning or the autumnal uh, equinox the day when uh, 12 hours of night and 12 hours of daylight. That's not what we used, even though that was the uh, official measurement on the calendar and in the Farmer's Almanac. When I was a kid, and see if this rings true, the first day of summer was... Well, last day of school is also good, but in Virginia we went to school a long time. Uh, first day of summer for us was always June 1st. June 1st is when summer started, and August 31st was when it ended, right? None of this June 21st and September 22nd. I mean, that's just plain wrong. Uh, when I was a kid, we were in this three-month pattern. And using that, it means that we are in the home stretch of summer, right? And, and fall is, is just around the corner, which also means that we are getting close to tying up the series that we started in June, dealing with living by the Spirit. In other words, the fruits of the Spirit. And so that's going to be ending soon. Now, we have had six messages so far in this series. So lucky y'all, you're all on number seven. That shouldn't be hard to catch up. <laughs> so, but I'm going to review right here. Okay, we're on the, the seventh. Uh, during the first one, we talked about what living by the Spirit doesn't look like, and that's satisfying the desires of the flesh. That was the first one. In the second one, we considered how love is a decision and an obligation. Third, we talked about Christian joy and how it's grounded in faith and how it strengthens those who are suffering and how it should be shared within the body of Christ, with Christ's people. Then in the fourth message, we focused on Christian peace and how God has lived us, has called us to live in harmony with ourselves and with God and with others. In the fifth message, we dealt with spiritual patience and how it involves humility, love, and faith. And then last week, and everybody remembers last week, right? Did anybody else hear crickets? I just heard crickets. Uh, last week, we talked about kindness 
and how kindness is a part of God's nature and how it should extend to everybody and how it's only possible with, with God's help. Now, that's where we've been. And this morning, we are going to talk about Christian generosity. Or according to the literal meaning of the word, the Greek word that Paul used, the goodness that Christians demonstrate to others. And as a sign that God works in mysterious ways. I don't know if you all knew. Uh, I was in Virginia for about four days this past week. Uh, on Monday when we were going down, I've got this, this app on my phone called Curiosity. Does anybody else have that, that app? On, on the Curiosity app, they, they post articles that you wouldn't find in mainstream media. So they aren't fake. Uh, the, uh, there, and, and it's off topics that are, you know, a little off, a little bit, a little bit off the, the center. Uh, and this last week they had a, an article about generosity. And in fact, a, uh, an attempt by scientists to explain why we're generous. And uh, on Monday, I read this app, and the uh, article was entitled, now to get this, this is exciting, Your Microbiome Might Play a Part in Altruism. Your Microbiome, did you know that? Your Microbiome? Does, do you know what a microbiome is? I don't know. But it may part of it. Now, this was the first paragraph in the article. They might be microscopic, but single-cell bacteria are surprisingly powerful. Research has linked certain bacteria in the gut with symptoms of anxiety, depression, even autism. Now, scientists are beginning to think that bacteria may not just be out to destroy our mental health. They could be responsible for acts of altruism, too. In other words, some scientists now think that bacteria may actually cause us to be generous. And they've done some experiments to support this theory. Of course, I have no idea whether or not bacteria in my gut makes me put change in the cup of a homeless person in Pittsburgh. I, I really don't know. What I do know is this, that altruism or generosity or goodness directed at others, well, I'm telling you, that's not always easy to do. Or at least, we're not always willing to do it. I mean, suppose, and I want you to put yourself in this situation. Suppose I am at an intersection in any city, including, including stupid, and there's a guy standing there on the side with a sign. You know, that says, I'm hungry. You know, help me. And he's standing right by my window, the driver's side window. At that moment, when he is standing there, I am thinking of all kinds of reasons not to give him a dollar. I mean, good night, I'm in the car, I'm driving, I got a seatbelt, the, my wallet is here, I'm sitting on my wallet, Rocky, you're right, it's hard, I got to squirm around to get the wallet out, it's just not, it's really difficult, right? And I mean, he looks pretty able-bodied to me. You know, if he cleaned up, you know, maybe shaved or something, he looks able-bodied. If I give him a dollar, I am encouraging him, encouraging him not to go out and get a job, which is what he should do, right? I become an enabler. And nobody wants to be an enabler, right? And you know what? Now, <laughs> I give him a dollar. What's he going to do with that dollar? He's going to go and buy drugs. And you know, you can get a lot of drugs for a dollar. He is going to buy drugs because that's what they all do, right? Sure they do. We all know that. So he's there, I'm in my car. Regardless of what's swimming around in my gut, I'm going to do what? First, I'm going to avoid eye contact. Right? And as soon as the light turns green, 
I'm through that intersection. Hopefully before the bacteria kicks in. I'll tell you, being generous isn't easy. It's not nat doesn't seem to be natural. And I'll tell you, that's why I think it's a bummer that it's listed as Paul, uh, by Paul as the seventh fruit of the Spirit. In other words, according to the Apostle Paul, Spirit-filled Christians are generous. They're altruistic. They're good to others. Spirit for Christians must be generous. Not should be, ought to be, might be, could be, but must be generous. Now that's what he wrote. And unless I decide to take some white out, which is, which is nice, and white out the word in the list in all Bibles, we're going to have to deal with that. And so for the next few minutes this morning, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about generosity. And just like we did with love and joy and patience and kindness, we're going to use the Bible to define it and to better understand how we might do it. Now that's going to be our focus this morning. And I'll tell you, when we look at what the book says, I think there are four things we can say about Christian generosity. But I'm going to tell you right now, before we look at the specifics, when, we, when I read these passages from Scripture, you are not going to hear the word generous. You're not going to hear the word generous. Instead, it'll, be, it'll generally be the word good or goodness. But understand, Paul used the exact same Greek word in the passage from Galatians that lists his fruit of the Spirit. So we're talking about the same idea, regardless of the word that's used. And that appears in all the passages, as passages that I'll read. And so having said that, I think there are four things that Paul had in mind when he talked about generosity. For example, first for Paul, Christian generosity is directed away from self. And that's always the case. Christian generosity is always directed away from self. In other words, it is not about me. It's about you or y'all or us. But I'll tell you, it's not even always about us because it's also about them. You see, Christian generosity Generous goodness points out, it doesn't point in. And I think we can see that in what Paul wrote to the Romans. He said, if our faith is strong, we should be patient with the Lord's followers whose faith is weak. We should try to please them instead of ourselves. We should think of their good, that's the word, and try to help them by doing what pleases them. Even Christ did not try to please himself, but as scriptures say, the people who insulted you also insulted me. And the scriptures were written to teach and encourage us by giving us hope. Now that's what he wrote to the Romans. And to the Galatians he wrote, share every good thing you have with anyone who teaches you what God has said. You cannot fool God, so don't make a fool of yourself. You will harvest what you plant. If you follow your selfish desires, you will harvest destruction. But if you follow the Spirit, you will harvest eternal life. Don't get tired of helping others. That's the word. You will be rewarded when the time is right. If you don't give up. We should help, again the word used, people whenever we can, especially if they are followers of the Lord. You see the kind of kindness, the kind of goodness, the kind of generosity Paul called us to show. Well, it's first about helping others, not ourselves. And that's number one. And second, it also, this generosity can also take a lot of different forms. 
In other words, how a person might show this kind of goodness, how he, how he or she might be, might be generous, well, it may differ from person to person depending on what they have to give. Now, that kind of makes common sense. And again, Paul is clear about this in his letters. But before I read what I'm about to read, I think it's important for us to remember that Paul lived in a very different time than ours. One that has different values and one that had different norms. Therefore, I think it would be a huge mistake to take something that he is using as an example to make another point and assume that he is prescribing an institution or maybe suggesting that we impose the example. The example is to make another point. But that's going to be clear when I read what I'm reading. So you want to keep that in mind. For example, he wrote to the Ephesians. Slaves, we don't have slavery, but Paul wrote to people who did. Slaves, you must obey your earthly masters. Show them great respect and be as loyal to them as you are to Christ. Try to please them at all times and not just when you think they are watching. You are slaves of Christ, so with your whole heart you must do what God wants you to do. Gladly serve your masters as though they were the Lord himself and not simply people. You know that you were rewarded for any good things you do whether you are slaves or free. Now, I don't think Paul is being pro-slavery here. Rather, he is showing that even slaves, and man, slaves have nothing. Even slaves can be generous with what they do have. Now, I think that's what he's saying. That was his point. And I think we should approach this other passage, what he wrote to Titus, in the same way. Again, to make a point. He said, tell the older women to behave as those who love the Lord should. They must not gossip about others or be slaves of wine. Slaves of wine. Okay. They must teach what is proper so younger women will be loving wives and mothers. Each of the younger women must be sensible and kind as well as a good homemaker who puts her husband first. Then no one can say insulting things about God's message. Again, I think he was using an example of how women in the first century, and understand women in the first century didn't have much either, how women in the first century could also be generous. You see, whether it's our time, or whether it's our talent, or whether it's our money, and money isn't a dirty word, or some combination of the three, generosity can take a lot of different forms, depending on what God has given us. And that's the second, his second point. And third, for Paul, Christian generosity is impossible without God's help. You see, it's not about trying harder. This isn't some kind of exercise to help us be stronger people. It's not about trying harder. Generosity isn't a test. Being generous is actually more focused on faith to God than on effort by us. I mean, I think that's why Paul called it one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's the result of the Spirit living and growing within us. He's given us the ability to be generous. And I believe we see what this point in Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, the passage I was thinking about, or I'm thinking about, is really long, too long for me to read. But in it, Paul talked about how he wanted to be good. You know, and he wrote it in the present tense, so he's describing himself now. He really wanted to be good. He wanted to be generous in his actions. He just couldn't pull it off. He wrote, I know that my selfish desires won't let me do anything that is good or generous. Even when I want to do right, I cannot. Instead of doing what I know is right, I do wrong. And so if I don't do what I know is right, I am no longer the one doing these evil things. The sin that lives within me is what does them. 
And given this situation, all Paul could say was this, but in every part of me I discover something fighting against my mind and it makes me a prisoner of sin. What control that controls everything I do? What a miserable person I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is doomed to die? Drum roll. Blah, 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 blah. Thank God Jesus Christ will rescue me. You see, God rescued Paul. And God enabled Paul to continue doing what he had been called and equipped to do. And later in the same letter, Paul wrote that this can also happen to us. He said, dear friends, God is good. So I beg you to offer your bodies to him as a living sacrifice, pure and pleasing. That's the most sensible way to serve God. Don't be like the people of the world, but let God change the way you think. Then you will know how to do everything that is good or generous and pleasing to him. You see, with God's help, we can be generous. And that's Paul's third point. And finally for Paul, Christian generosity has power. You see, it really isn't about making a personal sacrifice or demonstrating some kind of personal righteousness. Rather, generosity is about, and I'm, I, this may sound strong, but I mean it, generosity is about changing the world. Generosity is about changing the world. And I believe this is what he had in mind when he wrote to the Ephesians. You used to be like people living in the dark. But now you are people of the light because you belong to the Lord. So act like people of the light and make your light shine. Be good, honest, and truthful as you try to please the Lord. And to the Thessalonians he said, God chose you and, you keep, and we keep praying that God will make you worthy of being his people. We pray for God's power to help you do all the good things that you hope to do and that your faith makes you want, want to do. Then because God and our Lord Jesus Christ are so kind, you will bring honor to the name of our Lord Jesus and he will bring honor to you. You see, when we're generous, when we treat people well, when we display the kind of goodness God wants us to display, we are sharing the good news. Maybe not with words, but certainly through work. We are sharing the good news of the one who we know treats us better than we deserve. The one who cleansed our past and man, he has locked in our future. The one whose very life is an example of what generosity and goodness is all about. This is the one we share through our generosity. And brothers and sisters, sharing that good news, I'm telling you, it's going to change the world. It's going to change the world. Paul wrote to the Romans, don't let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. And that's the same word that Paul used for generosity. Defeat evil with generosity. Man, generosity has power. And I believe that's Paul's fourth point. Now, do you remember how I started the sermon? Remember I was telling you about that article from Curiosity? About how some scientists are trying to establish that generosity may be the result of bacteria? Well, this is how the article ends. These are the last words of the article. So, when Ebenezer Scrooge changed his ways on Christmas morning, it could have been the result of those three ghosts, or more likely, the bacteria in his gut finally got their way. Now, I don't know about you, but if that's true, it changes the way I hear a Christmas carol. You know, it loses a little bit of its... I don't know, punch, but I don't know if it's true. 
But what I do know is this. At least to me, Paul seemed to believe that, Christ, that generosity is something that all Christians are expected to show. And the Christian generosity is directed away from self and takes a lot of different forms. It's impossible without God's help. And when done, man, it has power. Now that's what Paul wrote. Which seems to me when you get right down to it, generosity is a whole lot more than just a gut feeling. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this little lesson in, in generosity. Now, help us, remind us, that this is, again, not an option. You know, you didn't lift those fruits of the Spirit and we can pick three of them. You know, this, this is what you've called Christians to do. And what's amazing is that we here have the ability to be generous. Lord, have mercy. You have given us the time and you have given us the talents and you have given us the means, the money, to be generous. Lord God, help us to do it. Help us to be generous. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, today is a, a special day. Uh, as you all know, every month here at the church, we gather around the table. And we remember the presence of Christ in a special way. Because he has invited people to gather around his table and share his meal, the bread and the cup. But as we gather around the table, there's one person here that we don't see. And that's Jesus Christ, because he is actually the host of the meal. He said that when his kingdom comes in completion, People will come from east and west, north and south, and gather around his table. And that's what we're going to remember, that's what we're going to be doing right now. So if this, this table, if these elements have some meaning to you, they mean something to you, I invite you to share them with the rest of your brothers and sisters as we remember and celebrate the presence of Christ with us all. Let's have a word of prayer. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks for you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light, inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of all life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day and beholding the glory of your presence. We offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we say. We acclaim you, Holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our Creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy you came to our help, so that in keeping you might, we might find you. So in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again you called us into covenant with you as prophets taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you love the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. 
To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, to the sorrowful joy. To fulfill your purpose he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe. To complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption. Recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory and offering to you from the gifts you have given us, the bread and this cup, we praise you and bless you. Lord, we pray that in our goodness and in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts of your holy people. The bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Grant that we may find our inheritance with all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. Now, on the night in which Christ was betrayed, after he had shared a simple meal with his disciples, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave them to him, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. And the same way, after they had shared the bread, he took the cup, and into the cup he poured the wine. And he said, This cup represents the new covenant sealed by my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you remember my death until I come again. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, grant us your peace.
Remember, the body of Christ was given for you. Remember the blood of Christ was shed for you. Lord God, you were with us as we gathered around the table. Be with us as we leave this place. Now, we know you will be, but help us to be aware of that, your presence. And as we relate to those around us, as we share with the people we meet every single day, help us radiate your presence within us and with us to them so that they may feel the peace and the joy and the hope that comes from trusting in you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. 
Now, we're going to end the, the service this morning by singing a, uh, a song that will be up on the screen. Now, I recognize y'all don't know it. So it's stand, listen to the first. You can listen to the, the first verse as you get used to the sound. Then you can sing along. Do we have sound? I hope. Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't, sound, doesn't look like we got sound, so we're going to have to fix that. Uh, since you're standing already, and we're after, after 12, we're going to work on We're still working on, on the, the music. Uh, go in peace. And remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is, is with you. You carry him out into the world. And share him with those whom you meet. And share him by being generous to those around you. And to empower this, uh, this lesson, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.